Go ahead. I just turned the video on. Yeah. I thought that I'd catch this for you. So uh, you were the last thing you said was a lot of doubt. Yeah. And then also throwing it away, but still there's uh, it comes back, but I keep throwing well, it away. Yeah, exactly. You're you're in the habit of having doubt. And there is sometimes it's some value and some useful benefit. But generally, no. Uh, let me give you an interesting example about doubt. Now, the example that I use is there the meditator is sitting in a retreat. He's just arrived. And the thought comes in the form of a doubt. Did I leave the refrigerator door open? And now he's going to worry for the next day or so, or he's going to leave the retreat simply because he doesn't know. And it doesn't even matter if the refrigerator door is left open or not. But in fact, almost all of the refrigerator doors I know are manufactured so that they will close automatically. It's part of the feature. By the way, the original story was that the guy was having sex when he had the idea, is the refrigerator door left open? Okay. So that kind of thought will destroy almost anything. Yeah. And here your thoughts are, is my practice good enough? Or did I leave the jhana door open? And let all the jhana escape. <laughs> and there's no end of the doubt. Until it gets weaker and weaker because it gets no toehold. As soon as you see the doubt, you just throw it out. You don't entertain it. You don't keep those neurological pathways humming along. And over time, they will fill in with the dust of mentality. And so you don't have those doubts come up anymore. They come up kind of rare. And generally, when they do come up, they've got some value to them rather than the uh, constant frivolous kind. Like, how's my... Ha <laughs> That's actually what I was about to say is very common in the mentality of the people, the way they're re raised. How am I doing, Daddy? <laughs> is this the right way to do it, Daddy? And we go around asking the world, the biggest daddy of all, the whole darn place, is this good enough? Am I okay yet? All right. And that's kind of who you're asking. Yeah. Is yeah. this good enough yet? And it's you that make that choice, not the big daddy in the sky or the big daddy in your mind or the big daddy of memory or the big daddy who used to be a big daddy and is not anymore. If you're lucky, he's just an old friend. <laughs> but we still want that advice. We want that encouragement. We want to be loved. Because we're not good enough already on our own. Until you practice being already okay. So how am I doing, Daddy? Those kind of thoughts you can say is, I see that. And guess what? I don't even have to ask him. And the question itself is irrelevant because they already know the answer to it. And that is everything's OK. Everything's hunky dory. The reality is, is everything is fine. So why do I keep asking questions? The answer is just because I've been searching, searching for approval. My whole life. Mm. Yes. And you're the one who does the approving. And guess what? You've already gotten your own stamp of approval. Kachunga. Done deal. <laughs> yes. Already good enough. No need to worry about it.
no need to worry or think or fret or restlessness your way into it. It's just already okay. And so whenever you see those doubts come up, you can say, aha, I caught you again. Hello, darkness, my old friend. You've been pestering me for years, and you're pestering me again. <laughs> then another point. Um that I have noticed is during my practice, sometimes very sneakily, there is this movement of the mind of trying to force, trying to move uh, the unwholesome attitude away or the unwholesome thoughts away. And it kind of seems uh, like an unnecessarily large effort trying to do that. Mm -hmm. That's another training that we get from childhood. We want approval, so we don't want to have the judge, whoever that is, to judge our bad behavior, our wrongdoing. And so we kind of hide that wrongdoing, bad behavior, mistakes, etc., like that, that we're making. We want to hide it from ourselves and hide it from our daddy. And it can't be hidden. Oh. And we hide it because we don't like it. We're not supposed. We're not going to get um, approval if all of that stuff is still happening. Yeah. It's right. So, in the correct practices, we stop hating our bad behavior. We stop hating the uh, the doubt when it comes. That's like I said, hello, darkness, my old friend. You see, used to when the doubt would come, you'd just be doubtful. Now when the doubt comes, you hate it. Oh, I shouldn't be doubtful. Mm. So you've actually doubled the dukkha. Yes. Yes. Okay. This actually is a um, a point to make that comes from the Buddha's uh teaching is actually the Saba, no, sorry, it's the simile of the snake. I don't remember the Pali name, and it's Sutra number 22. And that uh, whenever I see any videos on YouTube of snakes, I always remember this one video. Because I see a lot of people dealing with snakes by picking them up by their tail. And then they have to be very, very careful to keep the snake from biting them. But the Buddha recommends that if you're going to catch the snake, catch the snake by the throat, by the head. He recommends taking a fork, a stick that's got a little fork in it, and then put that stick to fork that uh, snake's head so that you can then grab it high up on the throat. You want to make sure that when you grab a snake, his mouth is shut and you're going to keep it that way by putting your hand on his, uh, the top of his head and your hand on the uh, top of his throat to make sure that the snake's mouth is shut and is going nowhere. Of course, with the python, now you're going to have the darn thing wrapping all over. But the Buddha was talking about that this is how we grasp the Dhamma. That we hear that it's a hindrance to have um, a doubt. And so what we do is we grab that Dhamma point by the wrong part and it winds up biting us. Oh, now we've made a rule thou shalt not have doubt. And every time the doubt comes up, because you've got a habit of it and it's going to keep coming up, you're going to feel bad again. Yes. You're going to double the dukkha. That's what the Buddha means about picking up the Dhamma from the wrong end. You got to pick it up correctly. And if you do, then it's the elimination of the Dukkha, not doubling it. So when you grab that doubt, grab it by the throat. Grab it by the top of the head. Grab that thing like it was a snake and you can throw it out. 
rather than, oh, poor me, I've got doubt. Let me see if I can touch it and wrangle it while it bites me. <laughs> yeah. So don't let the Dhamma create new dukkha. That is, in fact, the hallmark of the Western Buddhism in general, is, is that people create more dukkha by the way that they're practicing. They're not practicing correctly. And so they wind up getting bit every time they sit down for meditation. In your, in your example, when people have doubt, they feel bad. When the mind wanders away, they feel bad. When they're not getting out of the meditation what they wanted, they feel bad. Look how much opportunity there is in meditation to feel bad because they're not practicing correctly. Yeah. And so, and so the right way to practice is grab that snake right by the throat, right by the top of the head and yank him out so that he doesn't bite you on the way. And the Buddha made also the statement, Aha, I see you, Mara. Aha, I see you, doubt. Doubt, I see you, worry. I see you wanting stuff. I see you wanting to get rid of stuff. And so those are all the hindrances, plus the other one, which would be, uh, oh, a don't care attitude. Not in the sense of I'm already okay. It's in the sense of, well, I'm not okay and there's nothing I can do about it. Oh, poor me. Oh, okay, right. And so they don't practice at all. This is what is called sloth. And you know, in Australia, they've got um, uh, animals that they call a sloth. And they climb trees and eat eucalyptus leaves and get high off of that. And then they don't go anywhere and they don't do much of anything. And in the right way, sloth is wonderful. But if it's uh, done in the wrong way, then it's a hindrance. And so these hindrances is what people actually then begin to hate because the hindrances prevent them from getting anywhere and yet hating the hindrances is yet one of those classic hindrances this is why we so many practice the dhamma by grabbing the snake by the wrong section and it winds up fighting them yeah, it can be very sneaky. So, practicing correctly, we begin to enjoy the doubt. We begin catching it and, and being joyful. Oh, I see that. So rather than being doubtful and worried and just stirring the pot, we can, look at that, look what I'm doing. And I can take that ladle and just throw it out. Don't have to stir. Everything is already okay. And that's such a simple practice. The people think that, oh, I have to have my questions answered. Oh, all the doubt has to be dispelled through information. And I'm going to read every sutta and I'm going to learn the Pali language and I'm going to go chant with the monks and I'm going to practice 16 hours a day. And I'm going to figure it out. All that time, they could have been happy all along anyway. You don't have to figure it out. That, in fact, that's a, another point that I can make in that regard. Have you seen spectacular uh, martial arts maneuvers on YouTube. Probably not. Yeah, like uh, the guy comes up with a knife. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, and you step aside and you wrap your arm around it and you throw his arm up like that, okay? 
and yeah. other stuff like that, spectacular maneuvers. And that uh, the, uh, we want to watch that video three, four times. We want to figure out actually what he's doing, right? That's what those videos are designed to do, is to get you curious, get you um, doubtful about what's going on. And guess what? The guy who is having, uh, is doing that maneuver, is not thinking about the maneuver because he's practiced it so much that in fact it's more of a, um, let us say, muscle memory now. And what it actually is, is that we need a teacher who is going to put us through the steps one by one very slowly and then keep doing it very slowly and then begin to speed up until we can do that maneuver full time. Meanwhile, all the people on the internet, on the video, watching that video on YouTube, they want to know. They want to know. As if if they you know, understand it, they can do it. No. You, one, you're not going to understand it. Number two, you're not going to do it. But number three, most of all, you're going to be remaining in a state of doubt and confusion. That if you really want to learn that thing, put that cell phone down and go to a dojo and get a good teacher who's going to put you through those steps. And yet, look how many of them are on the air. I mean, there's thousands of those little videos. They normally got the name Bruce Lee on them someplace. Watching Bruce Lee kick. And you'll never kick like Bruce Lee while you're watching Bruce Lee's videos. <laughs> never learn it. <laughs> never figure it out. So this is an, another thing. That's what our culture does to us. We think that we'll be okay if we can just figure it out. But in fact, figuring out doesn't, even if we do figure it out, doesn't mean we can do it. Let's stop trying to figure it out and practice doing it instead. That's the point of this little story is, is that don't try to figure it out. Because figuring it out intellectually is not going to give the application of it. We actually have to stop trying to figure it out and actually do it. Throw that hindrance out. Throw that doubt out. Come to that state of, oh, I'm glad I don't have to worry about that one. Mm -hmm. So that's what this practice is really all about. It's not a matter of understanding the hindrances. It's a matter of seeing them as unwholesome and throwing them out. Grab that doubt by the throat and throw it out. By the top of the throat, not the bottom of the throat where it can bite you. Early. Yeah. Early. So you go practice like that. You go practice that way. Come always back to the state of enjoyment. That don't let the doubts occupy your mind. Oh, am I doing it right? Oh, well, what if I try this? Or oh, if what if I try that? Instead of saying, oh, what if I try this? Just go try it. Just, right. just put it in application. Go practice. <laughs> mm. But all in all, it's a simple maneuver. It's a simple thing. But we have to make sure that we apply that simple thing to all four aspects. We apply it to the body, to the feelings, to the mind states, and our attitudes, and the mind objects, the thoughts, and whatever is happening. And so yeah. with those thoughts of hindrance, you see, in a way, the thought, the doubt, the hindrance, 
could not possibly enter the mind unless the mind was in the right attitude to do that. Um. And when the attitude of the mind is, everything is okay, I got this made, there's not a problem, then those doubts don't even arise. And so when you're practicing, it's not just a matter of throwing the thought out, it's also a matter of changing the attitude from the attitude of, I need something, into the attitude, I got everything I need. I've already got it all. That's where satisfaction comes from, is that thought, I've already got all that I need. Not a worry in the world. And so as we change that attitude, guess what? We also change the feeling. Into, oh, I need something. Into the feeling of, wow, this is nice. And so we're changing various things. That was actually noticed uh, during when there was this huge emotions in the last two days, uh, the attitude of wanting to push or change the emotions, and then that was noticed thrown away. And then it was just okay feeling those emotions. It was almost pleasurable, or it actually, it was pleasurable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the correct way to practice, that's it. And that joy will grow. The seed of joy is like the seed, let's say, of a, uh, a tomato plant. And that when we look at the seed of that tomato plant and we say, oh, it's not a tomato plant, it's just a seed, it's not good enough yet. Now we've substituted the seed of the tomato plant with the weed. We'd rather have a full grown weed than the seed of something valuable, useful, and wholesome. <laughs> That's where that not good enough comes from. Yeah, I feel good, but it's not good enough. Uh. Instead of saying, yeah, I feel good enough, it's just a seed, but that seed's going to grow. Let me keep nurturing and watering that seed. It's good enough. And then that good enough really gets bigger and bigger. Great big good enough. There's great fruit, great benefit. Does that help you understand a little bit better? Like you don't even need to understand. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just practice. Very, very, very helpful. Thank you. All right, Thomas, well, let's finish this call now and you go practice and call me again soon. Yes, thank you so much, Tamara. All right. See uh, you later. See you later. Enjoy.